Well, welcome everyone to chapter 10, the personality chapter. So what do you think? Your personalities change over the course of a life, lifetime or do they stay pretty consistent? That's going to be one of the big questions in the psychology world. And one of the main theories is that personality does indeed come from stable patterns. And there's different terms for those patterns, as you can see up on the screen. And we're going to deal with one of those particular trait theories called the Big Five Personality Trait Theory. But that's going to come later on. What we're mostly concerned with right now is how do our personalities even develop? Where do they start? And a natural place for us to start is with our friend Sigmund Freud. Now, a lot of the details, a lot of the specifics in Freud's theories have been tossed to the side. You'll read a little bit about that in your book and some of the what are called Neo-Freudians come along and push back against Freud. But you'll notice that a lot of his, or several of his core theories actually stick around in one form or another. So we've got to learn some of the basic core theories behind Freud so we can understand how they've stuck around in modern day psychology. So the first big term is psychoanalysis, and this is this idea for treating a mental disorder. You can see there at the bottom of your screen, that's kind of the famous stereotype of um, psychoanalysts and, and, and really psychology and therapy for some years is the old go to the lay on the couch and talk, just start talking to your therapist. So you can actually still go to Freud's home, see his office and see the famous couch. So you would lay on the couch and what you would do is what's called free association. You just started talking. Whatever came to your mind, you just talk, talk, talk. And what the job of the psychoanalyst was, in Freud's opinion, was to pick out kernels from what you were saying to see if there was some sort of deeper meaning in there. If you remember from the states of consciousness chapter, Freud came up just briefly, specifically in talking about dreams. And we talked about latent content and manifest content. And that latent contest content was what's kind of buried beneath the surface. That's what Freud was looking for with the free association and with dreams. All right. So psychoanalytic theory has five major components that we're going to look at. Number one is that human behavior is determined by innate and irrational drives. And those irrational drives are infantile. They're primitive drives. We're going to see this in a few minutes with the famous id, ego, and superego. And what's really important to Freudian psychology is that these drives are, are pushed by or they live in our unconscious. Okay, And generally, those drives aren't going to cause us to behave in proper fashion. Okay? Now, attempts to bring those drives into awareness, into conscious awareness, are going to meet some sort of resistance. Why? Because our consciousness might not want to deal with those drives. They might be too dark. They might be too primitive. There are those kinds of things within ourselves that cause disturbance, cause tension. And so for Freud, what he believed was that we would have these defense mechanisms that would pop up in order for us not to have to deal with some of those in um, those primitive drives. Mr. Woodard will talk about defense mechanisms on the next video. For Freud, one of the key parts of our lifetime was early childhood. What happened to us in early childhood for Freud really determined our personalities for the rest of our lives. Now, Modern day psychology is going to say, yeah, what happens to us in early childhood is extremely important. However, there's more leeway in modern psychology for growing out of certain issues, certain problems, being able to overcome, being able to work with certain things than Freud gave us credit for. Conflicts between the conscious and the unconscious can result in those mental disturbances. So when Freud was working with somebody that's had, let's say, high anxiety or real uh, uh, a depressed state, he started to look at where is the conscious self and the unconscious self kind of battling it out. And bringing those drives to consciousness for Freud is what liberated us from that tension might liberate us from anxieties, depressions, other types of disorders. So let's move my picture up here. So bringing it into consciousness is so vital for Freud, and that's why dreams were so important to Freud. In fact, he wrote a very famous book called Interpretation of Dreams. And if those dreams were somehow the subconscious, the unconscious kind of coming into consciousness in our, in our sleep state, 
If we could figure out what those dreams meant, we could better bring them into our conscious awareness and deal with those issues and hopefully liberate us from some of the tension that's deep within us. All right, so what we get, first of all, the unconscious, and we know unconscious, but for Freud, look specifically there at the screen, the unconscious is important because that's where all those repressed impulses, drives, conflicts, that's where all that stuff really lives in that unconscious self. So you got to bring it out into consciousness in order to deal with it. So there's the famous iceberg again. Mr. Woodard had shown you the iceberg in a previous chapter. But in Freud's model, you'll see here we have the id, the ego, and the superego. And the id is going to house all those drives. That's the unconscious level. The superego you can see here kind of spans all three, the unconscious, the preconscious, and the conscience conscious level and then the ego is the conscious level this is going to use reason and rationality and i'll explain that here in a second so that's again the famous iceberg model of id ego and super ego and how they correlate to the unconscious pre-conscious and conscious level so with the id ego and super ego the id is going to be again those primitive drives if we have Freud was big on repressed memories, memories that we didn't want to deal with, so we hide them in our unconscious. So what the id is, is the housing place for all of those things. Now, it's easy um, example here, uh, and it, it's basic storyline of one of the um, uh, scenarios you might have gotten with Kohlberg in the last chapter. So your teacher asks you to meet after school. Um, grades aren't doing so well, so they just need a quick meeting. You go into the classroom, teacher's not there, but next week's test happens to be laying on the desk. What do you do? The id in those primitive drives, it's not even a question. You grab, either you grab the test and put it in your bag, or you grab your camera and start taking pictures of the test. If you've got a bunch of friends in the classroom, you're going to forward those pictures to your friends. If you don't have very many friends in the classroom, you keep it to yourself and you set the curve. Okay? So for the id, those are those, again, those infantile drives. Now the superego is kind of the other side of the story here. These are those morals and values that we learn from society, from our parents. But the superego goes a little, sometimes a little too far morally. So perhaps the superego, when that test is laying there on the desk, the superego might go, oh my gosh, the test is in the desk. What are we going to do? Well, let's see. First of all, let's make sure the test gets in the desk. And then I've got to go find the teacher. And if I can't find the teacher, I'm going to find a different teacher and let them know what happened. Maybe I should go to the principal and let them know what's happened. The superego is like morals on steroids. It's not that the superego is bad, but sometimes the superego can go too far as far as the moral life is concerned. There, the superego is just fully concerned with doing the right thing, which sounds good, but again, in our simple little example, can go a little too far. And that's where the ego comes in. Remember, the ego is in that conscious level. And that's that rational part of the personality. This is the mediator between the id and the superego. So for the ego, you walk in, you see the test on the desk. The ego might say, well, let's just make sure that this thing gets put in a safe spot. So you might see if the desk drawer is open and kind of slip it into a book in that desk drawer and then call it good. Just leave the classroom or wait for the teacher. And maybe even the teacher comes in and you just say, hey, I didn't know if you were coming back, but here's what I did. The ego is that rational, realistic side of things. But you can see here for Freud with these three aspects of personality, how there's kind of this like constant tension. And it makes sense to a degree, right? If you walk in, you've got a little bit of a, a debate on your hands. You see that test on the desk, you've got to figure out what to do. And for Freud, these are the three aspects of our personality, which are going to help you make that decision. Okay, I'll be done now. And Mr. Woodard will take over with defense mechanisms.